recording's happening. So welcome everyone. I'm going to start sharing my screen and I'm sharing and I'm gonna start my presentation. And then I'm going to close this up. Excellent. Welcome, thank you for attending the call. Um, today we're gonna to be talking about uh, is business agility at scale doable? Before I start onto the talk, I first want to make a note about the Agile 20 uh, festival. Uh, I want to give a big cheers to my friend uh, Scott Sveenwright, who um, is the leader of this festival. He had the, he's the vision owner. And then my great friend Craig, who has offered to help me out tonight to, to be a co-host, to let people in throughout the talk, whoever decides to come along um, and just keep an eye on things uh, whilst I present to all of you. Um, Agile 20 uh, Retro Festival is a global festival, uh, free for all. It's an opportunity to give us a bit of uh, relief during this whole COVID journey. Um, it's, um, it's, it's going on till the end of the month. Um, I'm sure you've all had access to the website so you can see when there's other talks. So by all means, keep on going and attending to all the talks that are available based on what you're interested in. And uh, there is a code of conduct, but I'm sure if you, we're already halfway through the festival, so I'm mindful that you probably have heard this spiel a few times over, but just to be uh, aware, this is a safe space. Um, we're here to respect one another. If there's something that you don't like, then you, by all means, I won't feel, um, upset if you choose to exit the, the call. I don't think I'm going to be saying anything controversial or, you know, to say something privately or you can reach out um, or also primarily also with other people who are engaging in the call just to be mindful and respectful of others. Um, I'm sure this isn't uh, something new and I'm, I'm actually 100% positive that you will all have fantastic behavior, but it's something that is, uh, you know, we, we need to mention as speakers. So on that note, I will start the talk. Okay, so I put in a quote, this is my own quote, you know, for deep philosophical thinking. Will we be able to truly be better uh, than we were yesterday to allow us to enact agility? And that's the concept is that, you know, about being better to allow us to be more agile. Okay. So, why can't I move down? Oops, there we go. So, just a little bit of background myself. I have 22 years of industry experience. These are a number of organizations that I've worked across. Um, you may notice that I have a, a North American accent. Um, I'm originally from Canada, and then I started my career in New York um, with Accenture supporting Marsh McLennan companies. And then I moved across to the UK about 22 years ago of where uh, primarily my experience fell within large financial institutions, but I also worked across uh, public sector, aviation, um, energy, and also consultancies. Basically, this is to show to you that even though I think I don't look like an old dog. I am a bit of an old dog and I've been around the block a little bit. So um, I, I am coming in with a certain level of experience and knowledge when discussing this topic, just to give a bit of a sense of confidence that I didn't just come up with this uh, idea, you know, from uh, reading just one book or something but actually was developed based on a, a large amount of experience uh, from my own journeys and also speaking to a number of key uh, C-level leaders and also agile thought leaders within the UK and across the world. So the question is, is business agility at scale doable? Okay, that's the question today. And through my findings, I'm gonna show and explore, you know, what is it? What's it about? Um, uh, and try to answer the question. So before I get into the talk, I want to ask you guys a bunch of questions. And please, before you respond, try to keep the response to the three questions in one text box. 
and um, keep it quite short. Uh, so the first two are yes or no answers. And then the last question is as a word or you know a sentence to just understand your thinking and where you are today in terms of this subject. So the first question is, do you believe agility at scale outside technology is achievable? Yes or no? Have you ever experienced business agility at scale? Yes or no? And can you define business agility at scale within a word, maximum a sentence? And at this point, please share. Okay. So just share along. And mindful why. I can't, you know what's interesting? I'm um, I'm presenting, but with this presentation, I'm unable to see the text box. Hmm, Craig, could you help me with this? Yeah, um, I, well, I can see it in mine. Um, there's a couple of answers so far. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just going to zoom a little bit up there to say, we've got uh, Mark Walsh oh. saying, yes, yes, and he's delivering the scaled agile now. Excellent. Um, Cynthia has just said yes. I'm not sure if that was to the first question or all of them. And Russ Lewis says yes, no, no. Ian Reese says yes, no. And it adds our principles across the enterprise. Um, I answered yes, no. And the whole organization is agile. And uh, we've also got uh, Marcos saying yes, no. The entire organization is aligned and focused on the customer and delivery of value. And Mark says, stop sharing your screen and the chat will appear. Uh, <laughs> There's a few other answers. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mark. <laughs> no, I know. Okay, well, hence why I have Craig There's here. a few other answers as well. There's actually quite a few answers. I don't mm -hmm. know if you want to read them all yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Chung says, yes, yes. The entire company organization is nimble and able to respond to rapidly changing competitive landscape. Uh, Aaron says, yes, yes, co-create the most meaningful value, flexible with customers. Sheila says, yes, yes, responding to deliver a product to market before a niche market closes. Uh, David Evans says, possible, yes, seen it in person, uh, no. Uh, and then define definition is organization tries to deliver customer value sooner as a core value. And then lastly, Dominique in Paris says yes, and then no. And then the definition is I would make a distinction in scaling big teams versus generalization to the whole organization. And finally, well, an answer has just come in from Andreas. Uh, yes, yes, and the right flight level. Is that a reference perhaps to Klaus Leopold, is it? Oh, no. I don't know. No. Uh, um, and our Brian has just said yes, no, and still searching. OK, cool. That's great. I, I, I like the fact that there's a lot of yeses um, and that there, and the next, second question is a lot of yeses. That's really great. Okay, let's go. So I, uh, I believe in Google. I believe that if you search, search Google for an answer, Google will give you the knowledge that is there at a mainstream level. And that's quite important because um, even if somebody doesn't like that, the reality is if it's a mainstream knowledge, most people are gonna believe that. It's, it, it hits the general mark, which is not something that one want, wants to always do, but actually it is an important technique to say, hey, what, what's out there in the mainstream? What are, they, what are they sharing with us? So the first question I asked Google was, define me business agility. And it says, as it says in the screen, you know, and in summary, you know, business systems that can rapidly respond to change by adapting, right? So it's the ability as, as an organization to rapidly adapt to market environmental changes in a productive and cost-effective way. Then I asked, uh, okay, um, business agility from the Business Agility Consortium website. A little bit more of a specialist thing. Okay, so again, pretty much the same thing. The organization ability as, has the ability to respond quickly to market changes and also customer demand. So the, the 
consistency here is being able to respond quickly to market demand to customer needs at an organizational level. I then asked Google, give me an answer around business agility at scale framework. Every single hit was safe. I became a safe SPC certified earlier this year and I can, and I've been working with SAFE for about four years now, and I can categorically tell you that SAFE is not the answer to be able to achieve business agility at scale. SAFE is a very good framework when you're trying to get organized people around a product from idea to value and to increase the, the speed around product delivery. But SAFE actually categorically highlights that there are two operating systems within the organization. One is the hierarchy and the other one is the value stream. And within the value stream, that's when you create your arts or your release trains, which basically helps you deliver your product faster, leaner, slicker, blah, 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 and you throw automation into that space. But what, I'm, what we're talking about here, and when you look at the de definitions, it's not only product, it's actually looking at the whole organization, the entire entity end to end, and very much looking into the space of the hierarchy, which SAFE does not go into, okay? So I'm not poo-pooing SAFE because it is a framework. I use it, I'm certified in it, I'm happy to coach and educate people in it, and it is very useful, especially when the organization has enough time and money to invest in it, to be able to enact it properly, but it's not going to answer. It's not going to give you uh, business agility at scale. So the, it, 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 it can start the journey, but it will not get you the end result. Okay, so I went to uh, the Business Agility Institute and looked at their reports. They develop reports um, the last four or five years where they go and they review a number of organizations worldwide. Um, and they define what good ag business agility looks like with five unique categories. You've got pre-crawl, crawl, walk, run, and fly. At this stage, can I ask, based on all your answers uh, previously, which I'm super grateful for, can you put into the chat, um, where's your organization hitting? Is it crawl, three to four? So give it a number. Don't give it a three to four, five to six, seven to eight. What's, what's it looking right now? And I'm going to ask Craig to read out the numbers. <laughs> do you want the numbers or do you want the words then? Which, whichever, whichever. Right. But numbers will be easier because I, I, I reference it in my head, but whatever. Okay. So far we have a walk and a crawl and a run. And somebody says, where's the icon for backsliding? Oh, and I then, love it. <laughs> and then we've got crawl, pre-crawl one to two. I don't know. Two and it's a governmental organization somebody put in or, or put in mine, which is a crawl as well. Yeah, so and basically, another crawl. Yeah, basically, and that's your crawl. Oh, it was a, a, an outlier here. Seven in places, two okay. to four everywhere else for 250,000 people. Um, and someone else has just said, I've got multiple clients across this range, but none are run and fly. Uh, someone else is saying crawl in the public sector and pre-crawl, one to two. Cool. Excellent. That's what I expected. So even if there's parts of the organization that are flying, remember, we're talking about the entire organization. Okay, It's about the entire organization basically being able to do that. And it doesn't matter how big it is. I'm, we're talking about organizations that are across the entire globe, multiple sites, hundreds, hundreds of tens of thousands of people being able to do like that. That's the question. And of course, organizations as small as like a few hundred, it doesn't matter. The, the, the definition is being able to respond to market changes and customer demands rapidly or as rapidly as possible. This definition breaks it down as to how quickly. So uh, I'm not surprised. Thank you very much for the share. It was really cool. So now I want to share a little bit, a few user cases I found in industry, just one from experience, one 
from learning a discipline and the other one when Trump, when buying a, a new bed due to living through a flooding earlier last year. So I'm just, and, and what I discovered and what I learned. And they all fell into the flying category and I will explain how they managed to do that. So the first one was Publicis Sapien. I worked with Publicis Sapien initially on the Lloyd's uh, engineering transformation program in 2018. And then I went in house in 2019 to help them resolve an internal issue for the organization. Now this is a 20,000 plus man or people, uh, I shouldn't say man, but like human people um, across uh, 20 different sites um, globally. And their problem was they had more clients than they could serve. Um, and that sounds like, ooh, that doesn't sound like such a big problem, you know, if you have more business. But actually, from a reputational perspective, if they have potentially sold business, but they can't service it, that could seem very bad for the organization. And they were struggling to bring in enough people, enough quality people into their space um, fast enough to be able to serve the demand. So they wanted to figure out how could they hire more people and how could they bring in more ensuring still quality to be able to serve the demand. And also there was a secondary need. Um, Publicis Sapient is owned by Publicis Groupie. So Sapien actually is an asset to a much larger house. And from the larger house's perspective, they want to be able to see a greater profitability. At the end of the day, it's their asset. So even though the company was always very successful, they kind of needed to be more successful. So they needed to figure out how could they actually transform themselves as quickly as possible without a very large investment and kind of doing it themselves whilst they were operating. Okay. So what happened? How did they start? Well, first they appointed a new CEO who I met, lovely guy, great energy, who led the change. Okay. He communicated with everyone on a regular basis. He would go and walk uh, the floors. He would meet people. He would send every two weeks emails that he wrote himself. He highlighted um, key, nine key strategic OKRs, these are objectives, that the leaders of the organization aligned to and committed to which objectives they could support. They then brought in specialists like myself and uh, other people to help teams um, look at their current flow, identify their current systemic issues, their fat, and be able to fix areas that were causing real delay and, and basically money spent on allowing them to achieve their, their goals. And then and en enable them to understand how to organize themselves a better, look at um, visualization of their work, you know, agile techniques, but primarily it was very much focusing on the common goal, the common vision, being led by the ultimate leader, which was then supported by his leadership community, really good comms, the, the, the support to understand problems, but not only that, be given the support to fix problems, right? Because there's many organizations out there that know they have problems, but they A, they don't wanna talk about it, or B, they know it's there, but they don't wanna fix it for whatever reason. Um, I have no idea why, but that wasn't happening here. Okay. The next one, Ford. Great. Ford in 2006 nearly became liquidated. Can you believe that? Like no more Ford. It was really bad. And we know how big Ford is. Pretty much same kind of story as Publicis Sapien. Newly appointed CEO. By the way, I'm not saying to be able to achieve business agility at scale, you need to appoint a new CEO. But this just, this is what just happened. Okay. Um, Newly appointed CEO had the approach of having um, an open dialogue, an open community. If anyone had a good idea, they could go and contact him directly and share that idea. And if it worked, he would apply it. He developed a completely new strategy. He communicated on a regular basis. He reviewed um, very old um, commitments that were no longer serving the organization to allow the organization to move freely and be able to achieve their results. 
Uh, they had a clear goal, a clear mission. Basically this, you know, there's now, mm, okay, there's something repeatable here. Okay, now let's move on to dreams, okay? I learned this story through somebody who was selling me a bed at dreams and he was so passionate and be mindful. This guy um, was a highly educated person who finished a degree in engineering and decided to keep on working for a bed company because he was making more money than as an engineer and he loved it more. He loved the company. What happened? In 2014, again, nearly administration, they did appoint a new CEO. I'm not saying that is a prerequisite, but seems to, it was a common occurrence, but please don't take that away and say, if something's not working back home, we got to get rid of our CEO. No, 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 no. But what I'm trying to highlight is that the leader of the house needs to be demonstrating the want, the change. So if the leader currently isn't demonstrating the want and the change, there's an opportunity to help that leader uh, take the, that, that step forward. So newly appointed CEO, uh, they uh, clear, clear vision, clear strategy, clear, the same thing, clear communication, um, total openness and transparency. He showed me an app where every single person in the company could go and share their ideas, uh, their feedback, and there would only be two people in the organization who could edit anything in that app, right? So in summary, the ingredients is to be able to help an organization achieve agility at scale for, to, to get to flying are things like, I'm gonna repeat myself, I apologize, but you know, uh, that's how we learn is why just uh, focusing on the, the same things and repeatable um, elements is clear vision goal and a goal that's defined. A leader owning, leading and enacting the new ways of working, a leader encouraging openness. So that's very much cultural driven. Work is out, outcome driven and is measurable. Being able to articulate the business benefit. Uh, there is alignment within the organization. There is a culture for doing the right thing. Systemic issues are being surfaced and encouraged uh, to go and fix them. And you have regular and clear communication. And these attributes cause organizational alignment for a common mission and cultural and behavior shifts leaning towards agility. So it's these elements that actually help not only transform the organization to becoming more agile, but it supports the cultural shift that is needed to be able to sustain the agility once you've started the transformation and have started the new journey into the new way, which over time is no longer classed as the new way, but is the only way. So I went back to, so, so from my learnings and searching around and what have you, I went back to the Biz, uh, Business Agility Institute findings and in the report of 2020, they highlighted the key areas, gaps of what's causing organization not to achieve flying. Now, year on year, they're reviewing more and more businesses. By 2020, they were reviewing around 500 companies worldwide. And uh, in majority, these companies were coming out of uh, crawl into walking. Now, agile transformations have been going strong since 2014. So what we're saying here is that for about six or seven years, we've been spending billions and billions of dollars, pounds, whatever currency you are working in, and organizations are just moving from crawl to walk. Okay. Now the, the, the user cases that I highlighted that went into flying, they managed to turn their ship around within a year to a maximum four years. All right. So when you look at these here of the gaps, they're actually the same, it's actually the same items that I had just highlighted in the previous slide as to these are the good ingredients that help you achieve business agility. Here they're saying, these are the gaps that are not allowing organizations to achieve business agility. So I thought, mm, that's, quite, that's quite interesting, you know? And out of this list, the number one issue is leadership. Now, why is that? 
Well, historically, when we look at agility and where it started from, it actually started at team level. And it was very product driven. Actually, it was very software product driven. If you look at the Agile manifestos and the 12 principles, they highlight specifically software. I today adjust that word to product. I consciously do that. But um, otherwise, the principles are fantastic. They still stick. But the origins was very much at team level. I don't know if 20 years ago, they, when, when the guys got together and signed the manifesto that they thought that today in 20 years, actually the big question is how do we get an entire organization to become agile? Okay. So, um, and then if you also look within like SAFE, where they highlight the two elements of the hierarchy, where that's very much where the leadership is living versus the value streams, which is very much, you know, um, the, the product settings. There's, there's this divide. There isn't, there, even though they talk about leadership leading the change, edu educating the leadership, there isn't this emphasis on going into the area where the leaders are living into their systems to see how it can be adjusted to allow the leader to enact the new behavior, which is driving the change forward. Because actually the culture of an organization sits with the, I, I say this in a very um, way, I hope I don't offend anyone, but it sits with the GAFA, okay? It sits with the ultimate leader. So I have been in so many situations as a coach, as also as an empowered leader at a very senior level. But if I am not aligned to my leader, the ultimate leader, and we don't agree on what is good for the area from a cultural behavioral standpoint, and if the leader isn't prepared to support it and drive it, then I am at grave risk and I put my team at grave risk because the what is being shared doesn't then align to what the leader wants. And when the leader walks into a room and says, I want something, and it doesn't ultimately align to what the area is being told, there becomes confusion. And when you have confusion, you start having lack of alignment, and then things start to break down, things start to slow down, and communication breaks down, and the lack of trust. So we need to empower the leadership. And it's a very different technique to enacting agility at team level. So what have we learned so far? Okay, well, basically what I'm saying is that to be able to enact agility at scale, you got to start at the enterprise space. But the irony is the majority of us don't sit at the enterprise space. We don't have that opportunity to influence. And there's a lot of us who want to know, well, at least how can we try to help a little bit? How can we start influencing a little bit? So I came up with this concept and I also saw this written in uh, LinkedIn. So I, I took it and I said, oh, I quite like it, which is doing better, concept of doing better. Okay. And here's some ideas of, of how, how, how one can start to do better, which can then influence beyond just the team and that product. First thing is make sure that all the work aligns to key strategic OKRs. I still see so many products that are running, doing great, you know, in an art, great agility, great everything, but they're still uh, not fully aligned to, a, to, to strategy. Okay, so make sure that the work has meaning for the ultimate organization. And if it doesn't ask product management, what's going on, why not, and can you help us? And if there is a gap, I highly recommend to raise a risk because at any given moment, that, that product, that project could fail. So there needs to be a reason why something is happening. And it's a very quick win. Next, when you're working with the team or when the team is working on the product, let the, have the, encourage the team to think beyond uh, their product into the organization by 
based on things that they're touching to support their product. I'll give an example. The product, most of us don't work in our own little bubble. We will always be touching upon elements that we need, our dependencies like group governance, legal, marketing, group comms. And we will be interacting with them and we will be working with them. So if we find that actually uh, something's pretty heavy and and actually, if we could fix it whilst we're doing the product with them, of course, ask them, don't do it just like that. There has to be an agreement. But if the area is open to get help, to make it leaner, smarter, better, which they, it then becomes a repeatable pattern, which can be shared with others through a community practice or what have you, you have a win. You're starting to influence a better change for a better organization to have greater agility. The next thing is to share good news stories. Even if the good news story is not a good news story, but is a lesson learned, a fail fast, regardless, share the stories so that you're able to have learnings on an exponential, right? Don't, don't keep things to yourself. Share them through show and tells, um, group calls, whatever mechanism. See how you can share it so you can help others. And then ultimately, if you're at the team level, at the mid-tier level within an organization, be very close with the leader. Be close with the leader, get the, help the leader to enact the new behavior, align to the leader, and then ask the leader to influence other leaders so that other leaders influence other leaders and then they influence other leaders until at one point you're, speaking, you're sitting in front of the, the chief leader and the chief leader is listening because the organization want to do better. So apart from that, right, as specialists, when we come into an organization to help achieve agility, doing better, what have you, it's not enough to just throw a framework, which I have heard specialists say, oh, let's just throw safe at it. Let's just throw less at it. Do we go and renovate our house that way? We're only going to take a wrench and we're going to use one wrench to organize, renovate our house. No, we, we bring in a toolbox with lots of different tools. And also we usually come with a plethora of specialists who have a specialist techniques, a plumber, a joiner, a bit, to be able to renovate the house. The same thing is to do with an organization. And so depending on what you're doing, you need to be using different tools. Here's just a group of tools that are readily available that should be in your toolbox, but keep on adding to it and decide as and when to use it. For instance, let's start with Know Your Flow, VSM mappings. It's a quick win to understand your systemic issues. This is where you get to start leaning things out. And after that, you go to red team thinking, let's go pressure test our strategy. Let's make sure that, you know, this is going to fly. Think like the enemy. Let's, let's avoid failing if we don't have to fail, right? Failing fast is a good thing from an uh, experimental perspective. But if we can avoid it and, and have success faster, by all means. Then when we want to figure out how to resolve a, a systemic issue or dig deeper into an area to come up with a solution, kick off the heart of Agile. It's a beautiful technique with a lot of positivity. Also, if you're going into an area and want to understand where they are, use the Kinefin model so you can be able to clearly articulate we're in chaos or maybe we're complex or maybe we're complicated. And then ultimately, I developed my own practice called the Agile Four P's, and this basically helps you create uh, alignment at any level, anywhere, regardless of what framework you use, regardless of what's happening, because at the crux of it, all frameworks align to four key elements, which I'll get into in a second. And finally, we're now working in the world of remote. And there's a great little technique called uh, remote agile framework that was developed out in Australia. It's an, and it's basically a canvas there that's ready to help um, execute from the beginnings all the way to operational for an entire value stream, every single aspect. Okay, but I'm just going to quickly go into the agile four P's. 
this, this isn't a sales spiel. This was highlighted to me. I've done this talk a few times where somebody said, you need to pull this out. You need to highlight this. So I'm like, okay, I'll highlight it. I'm actually going to do a separate talk on this at another time. But the reason why I highlight this is that if just as a reminder, a little we like checklist, right? To make sure that the ingredients is that you need to help, be able to help you achieve business agility at scale, as I highlighted, you know, is a leader with a clear vision, you know, the key, like meaningful measurements. Is there a value system in the house? Is the, are the people enacting the role correct? All of the, you know, all of these elements, the, this, this model should help you to, find out very quickly, is it happening or is it not happening, right? Where's the gap? Because ultimately, we all need to align to a common philosophy. In the Agile world, we use the Agile values and principles. We also use the House of Lean, and we use DevOps, DevOps Calm. And if you're using SAFE, you will use the SAFE 10 principles. And they all support one another. There's, no, there's very little contradiction. Okay. Also organizations create their own values system. And if you're in a position to encourage that, I would highly encourage it at team level, at the air enterprise, like the group level, uh, department level, and ultimately the organizational level. Because this is basically talks about how you're going to execute um, your philosophy and it also supports the culture. I'm sure you're all aware of it, but the philosophy, the purpose, the vision, the goal, the, the strategy, the meaningful measurement. Don't, don't underestimate it. There's lots of organizations out there, very large organizations who still don't get this right. And it, it's, it's key critical. You need that to be able to be sure that you're doing the right thing for the house. The people. What I've discovered when working with a lot of teams at scale, at transformational level, at team level, at art level, is a lot of people struggle with enacting the new rule. Either they're placed in a rule that they actually are not geared up to be able to perform, or the rule hasn't been properly defined by the organization. And so what's really important is to A, make sure that you know the people you need and then make sure to help the people enact their roles successfully so that they feel confident that when the question of I want is asked that they know how to respond and they can respond really well together. And once you get those three P's in line, you know exactly at, what, at that stage which practice to use. Should I use safe here? Should I use less? Should I use scrum? Should I? whichever one you want. Because if you try to fit an organization into a framework, you will fail. Every single organization is unique and trying to apply the Spotify model into an organization was a big, big mistake, which many organizations failed at and suffered painfully. The idea is respect the organization. There's a lot of knowledge there. There's a lot of things that do work. Don't try to go and fix everything at one time. Just find out where the problems are, get enact the people to uh, play a slightly different role, get them aligned to a common purpose, a common mission, and then get them to start practicing techniques that will actually add them value instead of saying, ah, we're this or ah, we're that. No, do what's right for the business, do what's right for your area. So on that note, I actually want to share some real life stories that I've lived through to be able to enact um, doing better from the team level and where one of the stories went all the way up to CEO minus two. Okay. So the first one is using the heart of agile. Okay. And uh, it's a very simple, cute. This is how simple and easy and yet it's got so much depth in using this practice. Picture it, moi, with my team, we're external plumbers, we come into site 
and the site is a client and they want to set up a, a you know we're there to do an adoption and it's open plan seating and uh, our sponsor wanted us to sit next to him and we wanted to sit next to him as well because we're new in the area and we also want to sit all together and over time within about two to three weeks we started to seeing like daggers being thrown at us by other people sitting in the area I thought what's going on one of my team members came over to me and said um, there are people complaining that we're sitting in their seats how is this possible this is open plan seating there started to be aggro bad tension and I said right okay I'm not going to go and make a complaint about this and make a point of this is not treating us fairly this is not nice I mean the standard is open open seating, open planning. No, 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 I'm going to go and find out what's going on. So I asked uh, some of the team members. Uh, one was the lead of the team and then some other people. And I said, I was wondering if you wanted to do this little test with this little model. I heard that there's a little problem. Um, do you want to meet up and go through it and collaborate and figure out how we can solve it together? Sure. In 30 minutes, we went through the entire um, paradigm where we collaborated to figure out what the problem was. We discovered that this was a team of 18 people that were coming from all over different parts of the UK. And for three days a week, they wanted to be co-located so that they could work really efficiently together. So we said, right, okay. We then um, figured out, we came up with a, a model where, okay, how we, can we adjust our seating to give them the space from Tuesday to Wednesday? Uh, Wednesday. We then said, okay, we have this model, we'll try it out, but in two weeks, let's come together and reflect and see if it's working. If not, then we'll adjust it. And then if we need to adjust it, we'll improve it, and then from there, we'll take it forward and we'll keep on trying. Well, let's put it this way. We didn't have to come back to see if it worked because it worked. Everything died down. It's absolutely perfect after that no more daggers people are now smiling at us we were able to actually build some trust you know people are like then waving saying hello and then a few weeks later all of a sudden a chap comes over to me and he puts his hand out and he says hi is your name evelyn and i said yes it is he's like hi i'm barry really nice to meet you i've heard a lot about you uh, let's catch up sometime and i said sure I didn't know who this person won. He walks away. I then look at my sponsor across the room and I realize, oh my God, that was the MD of the area. Why is he coming over to talk to me? Well, interestingly enough, good news travels fast. And what happened was we impressed the lead of the team that were having, you know, not happy with us with how positive we went about dealing with the problem that she told her boss who told her boss who told the MD. And then from there, we were able to build trust. And after a wee bit longer, that team and some other teams wanted to work with us and start their own adoption with us. Had to influence uh, people and, and make friends. Using SAFE, this is the second user case. The same team, now not the team that we were encroaching on their um, seating space, but the team that we were adopting. Picture this. We meet them for the first time during a PI planning event, which doesn't really look like a PI planning event. It's not a, it's not, um, you know, they're trying, which is cool. And the art team that is forming, half of it literally just got off a plane from India. Another large portion is still in India. We're coming in as uh, third party uh, plumbers, right? External plumbers. And uh, I also find out that the product um, manager is anti agile. He doesn't really like agile. He doesn't trust agile coaches. He doesn't trust any of this, but he's got to try and, you know, there you go. In 10 weeks from meeting, we formed, didn't really storm, but they, part of the adoption was they needed to develop from scratch a mobile application whilst learning how to do agility at scale. And they had an enormous amount of risk around their initial plan. In 10 weeks, we formed, we learned, we designed, we created, 
And the overall business owner, so the boss of the product manager, was able to present the and demo the application to his entire business area. Not only that, because we wanted to do better, we managed to lean out group governance um, key deliverables from 100 to 48. We then um, agreed with them to host everything on Confluence so that we could have automatic updates and uh, full uh, collaboration and transparency. And then we started to lean out each deliverable, deliverable as we were going through it because we had it to create for our product anyway, from an example, a PID from 47 pages down to seven slides. After that, we encouraged the area to create a COP, which we then shared learnings with other teams, which then saved teams time of creating uh, governance artifacts, which is a prerequisite for any banking institution. The head of group governance was so impressed that they basically called this piece of work best practice. Not only that, we also in, in, um, influenced group cloud to have better delivery. We influence um, group architecture. And at the end, I was sitting in front of uh, the CEO, Monis Two of the house, um, speaking about how the house could create greater alignment from a 25 man art team. Yeah, it's possible. Yeah. So to finish off with the flying user cases, what actually happened to these three wonderful companies? Well, Publicis Sapient managed to not only transform themselves and um, meet the demand on servicing clients, they managed to increase their turnover from 1 billion to 5 billion in one year. And they became known as the best digital transformation consultancy in the world by 2020. Ford, who is a near administration, managed to turn the ship around in one year. And when, and that was in 2007, and when it, there was the financial crisis in 2008 and the government offered a bailout, Ford refused because they said, we don't need it, we're financially secure. And then Dreams, who was a near uh, administration in um, 2014, by 2018, they became the number one digital, um, not digital, but they, I'll tell you, there's a reason why I mentioned that, number one bed company in the world. The reason why I mentioned the digital is because they managed to um, create a digital experience when buying beds. And I was able to reflect on that because uh, we had bought a bed from them two years prior where they, wasn't, they didn't have this service. And then within the two years when we went back as we had a flooding in the house and we needed to um, change our mattress, um, the experience changed by having uh, a digital element to it whereby they analyzed your sleep pattern through a mechanism that they would scan your, the, how your back was um, shaped whilst lying on a bed. And that way they knew exactly which um, mattresses to go and look at for the best experience. And I can tell you and assure you that our mattress is 10 times better than the first mattress we bought. And the first mattress was pretty awesome. So with that, with the question, is it doable? The answer is, yeah, it is. It's very doable. It's not a buzzword, which by the way, a lot of leaders today still believe it is because they can't see it, they can't describe it. I, this is direct um, feedback I was given to C-level leaders that I uh, interviewed to support this talk. But not only is it doable, it's really, really important. Because when you're with companies that are highly successful and are able to respond quickly to market demand and to uh, customers, generally what happens, and that they're winning, generally people in the house become very happy. And when they become happy, they have less stress. They go home, they're better for their family. And in the end, it helps make the world a better place. And so if we all try to do a bit better, amazing things could happen. And so on that note, I wanna thank you
And if you want to learn anything else or ask me any questions, I mean, I'm going to open right now the forum to ask questions, but uh, you can find me on LinkedIn. I have set up my own consulting company. I generally serve very large clients, nine to five, but on the side, I provide keynote speaking, um, advisory uh, training and one-to-one -one coaching. So if, you, if there's anything you want, by all means, get in touch and uh, you know, I'll, uh, I'll see if I can help. And if not, I can always advise somebody who can help. And on that note, that's me. I'm gonna stop sharing. And also, I'm going to stop recording. Where's the record button? I'm going to stop.